All right, okay. So Professor Chetan Yilmaz is a professor and the vice chairman in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Boğaziçi University, which is one of the best universities in Turkey. And he's the director of the Vibrations Laboratory. Uh, his research uh, focuses on vibrations and acoustics, mechanical design, phononic band gap structures, and elastic metamaterials. And um, so before he joined, Boziçi as a faculty, he was a postdoc uh, in our department at the University of Michigan uh, from 2005 to 2007. And he also received his PhD degree from University of Michigan. So welcome back <laughs> to University of Michigan today. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, Professor uh, Yilmaz had his P had his uh, bachelor's degree from mechanical engineering from Boğaziçi University and as well as his uh, master's degree from the same department and in addition to mathematics. Um, and he has numerous awards that includes the Turkish Academy of Sign Sign Sciences, uh, which is the Outstanding Young Scientist Award in 2017, um, Turkish National Science Foundation Career Award in 2011, uh, Excellence in Research Award uh, from Boziçi Foundation in 2019. And today we look forward to his hearing more about his research. So welcome and floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So let me share my slides. Uh, can you see it in full screen? Okay, good. Uh, thank you. So this was already introduced. So I got all of my uh, graduate degrees from University of Michigan as well as my postdoc. This is me uh, in 20 years back. And this is Professor Kikuchi in the computational mechanics lab. And uh, we did most of the foundations of this uh, work with Professor Halbert and Kikuchi when I was a postdoctoral researcher in this university. So in the outline, I would like to first focus on qualitative and quantitative differences between three major phonic band gap generation methods. I will highlight some differences, especially with some graphs as well as with some mechanisms. Then I will show early studies on inertia amplification, then move on to recent studies and application areas. Finally, I will uh, show some opportunities for future work. When you look for Bragg scattering, in fact, it's in the very simple terms, you would like to see periodically varying masses or stiffnesses, or in other words, in continuum setting, density and elastic modules can be periodically varied to obtain Bragg scattering induced gaps. In local resonance approach, you are adding local resonators to the structure periodically. These two methods are very well exploited in the literature. This third method, which we developed in, uh, when I was a postdoctoral researcher together with Professor Halbert and Kikuchi, is about inertia amplification. And here we add amplification mechanisms to the structure to increase its effective mass and introduce inertial coupling in the structure so that it can inter uh, generate anti resonance frequencies, and we can impede the vibration and wave propagation characteristics, and which is quite different from the earlier two that I will show you with some examples. The first thing that I would like to show you is a dispersion plot where we have a Bragg gap. And first, I would like to introduce topic for those of you who are not very familiar with the topic. So in this uh, graph, we see a square symmetric lattice, and we only see transverse waves, so we have a partial gap. And here we have a region in which there is no branch coinciding with this region. It's called a band gap. And if you divide the frequency by the wave speed, and you also scale it with the lattice constant, which is the length of this unit cell, then you get a reduced frequency. And if the reduced frequency calculated, you see it this way, a Bragg gap can only appear above 0 0.5. So there is a limit, a lower limit, it, at which you cannot obtain a band gap below that limit. And bandwidth uh, is very narrow here. It's about like 5% for this special setting, 
because on nickel uh, nickel particles are used in a aluminum matrix and their densities and elastic moduli are not very different from each other. That's why we have a narrow gap. If we are considering gold spheres in a silicon matrix, the contrast is higher in terms of elastic modulus and density. Then we can have a wider gap, which is like 10%, but still we are above this Bragg limit of 0.5. The reduced frequency is about 0.65 here. If we use more filling fraction instead of like 10%, if we use 26% of less spheres in epoxy matrix, in that case, we can have larger bandwidth but still we are above the Bragg limit. In local resonance approach, uh, we have a hard matrix. Inside we have some masses and they are covered with some uh, rubber or some uh, soft material, soft shell. So here we have like plastic coated gold spheres in a silicon matrix. And we have filling fraction of 10%. We are below the Bragg limit, 0 0.5 as the limit. Now it's like 0 0.125. Bandwidth is 12%. If we have more filling fraction, or like let's say lead cylinders in a glass matrix, we can enlarge the bandwidth, let's say like 35%. Uh, again, we can obtain gaps below the Bragg limit. But as you see, in order to enlarge the bandwidth considerably, you have to use large filling fractions. By the way, lead is significantly denser than glass matrix. So most of the unit cells mass is composed of the lead cylinders for this case. Some kind of designs can show both Bragg gaps and local resonance induced gaps. And here we see the real part of this band structure plot. In this part, we see the imaginary. As you see, for a Bragg gap, which is a Bragg limit here, we see like a parabola shaped imaginary part. And if this part extends to the right more and more, we have more attenuation in this system. For a local electronic gap, we have a sharp notch-like structure, and um, which is typical for this. And it's again below the Bragg limit. Now I would like to show you a little mathematical model, which can show both a Bragg-induced and local electronic induced gap by changing the parameters of this toy model. So here we have two springs K and little K is here. The central mass is MA, this mass is M. If you make this case equal to zero, then we have mass spring, mass spring. It goes on like this, like an alternating structure, which is the left-hand side setting. If you make K much bigger than K, then we have as if we have a hard shell on the outside, like hard frame, let me say. Inside we have a soft shell, then we have this mass. This is like the local resonance approach. So by changing K with respect to K, we can obtain this or that. The equations of motion can be written very easily. Y is the input for this uh, unit cell, which is one dimensional. And XA and XA are the outputs. You can write the equations of motion very easily. This is a diagonal matrix. So there is no inertial coupling. These are zero. This stiffness matrix has coupling here. And you can work out this matrices to find the anti-resonance frequency for this setting. Uh, at the anti-resonance frequency, the output vibration appears to be zero. And if K is much bigger than K, this expression can be reduced down to this, which is very easy to understand. If this is like very hard, then this K will be vibrating inside this shell and both of them will be added up to K over M under the square root will give you the resonance frequency of this little mass in the middle. Now let's see some band structure plots so that we can understand what's going on. Here we see the real part. And for the k equal to zero and k equal to two case, which I said that k equal to zero gives us the Bragg case, we have an upper branch here. The lower blue branch is just behind the red one. So it's just here. And the imaginary part shows us this parabolic shape, which is typical for a Bragg gap. And the Bragg limit can be calculated analytically as such. So above two, we have this nice round shape for this imaginary part, which is typical. If you increase this K, K from zero to 0 0.25 and K reduce it from two to one, by the way, in all the cases, I would like to keep the total stiffness equal to one so that I have nice comparison among these different designs. And I always have the same mass M 
MA is equal to 0.25. So statically, both of them have the same stiffness, same mass, but dynamically they have different responses because I'm changing the stiffnesses of these different elements. If I increase this K value, then the upper branch goes down. The lower branch is already there. My break gap is reduced. If you were to only look at the real part of this band structure plot, you would say that I only reduced my band gap for the break gap. But if you look at the right hand side, you see that you have a different shape here. In fact, there is an anti-resonance frequency, which you can calculate it with this equation. And there is sharp attenuation at omega z equal to four for this specific case, which means that if you were to excite this lattice, let's say one dimensional structure, at this specific frequency, you will have very high attenuation. So if you move along this lattice, the amplitude of the vibrations will decrease quite a bit. If you are around here, again, large amount of attenuation. So for the value of k equal to 0 0.475 and ka even reduced, now we have, sorry, this approach altogether. Then this notch comes down the Bragg limit. So we can have sub wavelength gaps, but when you are below the Bragg limit, the gap is very, very narrow. So you can obtain local resonance induced gaps above or below the Bragg limit, but if it's below the Bragg limit, then it is narrow. So there are two major questions that I would like to ask. Can we explain all type of band gap generation methods by just using masses and springs? In fact, if you look at the main papers around 2000s and earlier ones and main textbooks, most people try to investigate everything in terms of masses and springs. And uh, as I will show you, the answer to the first question is no. And uh, second one, can we think of an alternative basic element rather than a spring or mass to come up with another band gap generation method that is qualitatively different than Bragg's scattering or local analysis? So let me introduce our new element, which is a lever. So in this setting, we have a lever which is rigid and massless. The hinge spacing is L2, length is L1. So amplification ratio is L1 over L2. And we have a little mass MA here. And the motion of this MA is coupled to the input and the output, which means the following. I can solve for XA in terms of Y and X. So it's not an independent degree of freedom. So the earlier model, this has two degrees of freedom. Hence, there were like two branches here. Now, this model has only one equation of motion and one degree of freedom. There are other things different than the earlier model. We have an effective mass here, which is the multiplier of the output acceleration, which is m plus ma times alpha square. Alpha is the amplification ratio. Suppose that my hinge spacing and length are chosen such that L1 is 10 times L2 then alpha is 10 and alpha square is 100, which means that this MA is appearing as 100 times heavier at this point. So we are increasing the effective mass of this structure significantly by choosing a large amplification ratio. There is one other thing, which is called this inertial coupling term, which is the multiplier of Y double dot. And as this thing is vibrating, there are also inertial forces acting on the other side, this bottom side. So due to this inertial coupling term, the right-hand side of the motion can be equal to zero at a specific frequency, which is called the anti-resonance frequency due to inertial coupling. Now, the early local resonance method induces anti-resonance frequency because of the resonance of the attached resonator. This is generating anti-resonance frequency because of inertial coupling. They are two different anti-resonance generation methods. And I will show you that this kind of anti-resonance frequency has very different implications. Lever is a simple amplification mechanism. So, and we have proved that the effective mass is like this and we can obtain the anti-resonance frequency very easily. We can also generate amplified motion in a bridge type amplification mechanism. And this was the original uh, mechanism that we used in our first paper in 2007. 
on two dimensional structures, which can be used in two or three dimensions quite easily. Or we can use helical settings. For example, if I try to push these two di disks towards each other, the blue one tries to rotate because of this helix angle, theta. If theta is small enough, then there will be a large amount of rotation here and the effective mass will be increased. And you can calculate the anti-resonance frequency as such. And I will explain this mechanism in more detail, but this mechanism has a very wide band gap. We cannot uh, very easily derive the effective mass and anti-resonance frequency. There are longer derivations here, but still this offers the largest band, uh, band gap ever obtained in the literature. So I will explain this in detail in the coming slides. Now I would like to compare local resonance method and inertial amplification method by these two models. I have shown you that this model is two degrees of freedom. Y is the input, we don't count that. XA and X are the two outputs here. In this model, these motions are coupled to the output. So there's only one degree of freedom. If you look at the band structure, for this local resonance approach, we see two branches because we have two degrees of freedom. This one has one degree of freedom. Hence, we have this red branch only. I have chosen the parameters of these two settings so that, that they are the same. Total thickness is the same. Total mass is the same. MA is the same. I have obtained the local resonance gap at 0 0.92. And I choose theta as 17 degrees, exactly match the anti-resonance frequency by inertial coupling method. So both of them have the same anti-resonance frequency. But both the real part and the imaginary part of the band structure plots are quite different. First of all, these are two branches. There is one branch. Secondly, the branch for the inertial amplification case is lower than the local resonance induced gap. It starts at a lower frequency. So obtaining band gaps at low frequency is a hard issue. If you look at the literature, uh, you need to have large masses to obtain gaps at low frequencies. Here we have the same mass, and this is at low frequency. So there's one advantage here. Secondly, we are both of them can generate anti-resonance frequency below the Bragg limit. That's fine. But we have a very narrow gap for the local resonance induced gap. The inertial amplification induced gap is a semi-infinite gap. It starts here, extends all the way up through to infinity. So it is remarkably large compared to this little gap. And if you look at around the notch, the notch is wider for the inertial amplification induced gap. So qualitatively, they are very, very different. Now I would like to increase the mass of this local resonance induced system so that I would like to match the same lower frequency. So I increase the mass here to 2.56, then I can exactly match this thing and the lower frequencies are matching here. The gap is widened, but I have to use 10 times the mass compared to the amplified case. So I can use smaller mass in the system, but although I use more mass here, still it's limited by the upper limit here. The inertial amplification case extends all the way up to infinity. So in order to just to match the lower limit, I have to increase it 10 times, but I, I should increase more and more to reach the upper case, which I cannot do it practically. So in summary, inertial amplification achieves very wide band gap with using small masses. But this is theoretical at this stage because I assume that my links are rigid here. So I use K equal to infinity. Now I have to relax that option as well. First of all, before doing that, I would like to show you the first paper that applied this inertial amplification concept to a two-dimensional setting. This is the original paper that we write when I was a postdoctoral student with Professor Halbert and Kikuchi in 2007. We use this inertial amplification mechanism in this hexagonal symmetry case. And in the first example, I, we didn't put any stiffness or mass for this amplifier. We only use this corner masses. And we have two branches because we have two degrees of freedom, X and Y. This is for transfers and longitudinal waves. And the highest frequency is about 2.5 here. Now, we use half of the masses here. So it becomes 0 0.5. And we distribute this half of the mass to these six little, little masses. And then the total mass of the system is the same. 
stiffness is the same. When I use infinite stiffness mechanisms, I don't change the stiffness of this overall structure. They are like mechanisms. They don't add to the stiffness. So overall stiffness and overall mass of these two lattices are the same. But if you look at it dynamically, when I increase the effective mass of the system, these two branches are squished down. So the band gap can start at a lower frequency. As I told you in the earlier slide, making infinity for this uh, amplifier links is hypothetical. So we can relax that. I can make a K equal to 10, let's say. In that case, we have multiple branches. Since we have now seven different masses, and each of has two degrees of freedom. We have 14 different branches here. Some of them are coinciding. And if you look at the, if you zoom to the lower case, we see a large gap, then we have a flat branch, then we have a small gap. And if you look at the earlier slide, we had just two branches here. Now the same two branches appear here, but there's a cap here. This cap is because of the local resonance of these masses sideways and above which we have another little gap. Now I would like to prove you that the lower case is due to inertia amplification and the upper little band gap is due to local resonance. In order to prove that, we put some rigid links between these two masses. In this case, these masses cannot move as mechanisms anymore, but they can only oscillate sideways. So we don't change the oscillation characteristics. So the local resonance gap can appear exactly as before, see, same thing. But if you lose the mechanism effect, then this large lower gap is just gone. So we say that this because of this mechanism effect, we had this lower gap and that was our first paper on this topic. Then with Professor Albert, we wrote the second paper about the finite case where we have a six by six lattice, which is having a square symmetry now. And we use this k equal to 10 example again. If you look at it, similar structure, we have a large inertia amplification induced gap and a smaller local resonance induced gap here. There is a very different characteristic between local resonance and inertia amplification in terms of the wave propagation characteristics. Now I would like to summarize that in terms of the anti-resonance frequencies here and there. And you look, and you look at the frequency response function plot, you see many resonances, then we have a band gap, then we have again many resonances. These two anti-resonance frequencies are generated by two different means. The first one is because of the inertial amplification and coupling effect. The second one is because of the local resonance effect. If you excite the lattice at this frequency, the vibration amplitude gradually decreases towards the other end. So input is here, output is there. So it gradually decreases and it's like, minus 160 dB, which is almost nothing remains there. At this anti-resonance frequency, you see that there are light gray areas everywhere and we have some black dots. If you look at it, we have some corner masses and central masses and all the others are resonators. And these corners and these central points are black. You see, these are black. Centers and the corners of each unit cell are black and all the rest are resonating systems so as to stop these corner and central masses. So in a local resonance case, energy always propagate through the lattice. We can only uh, measure, if you only measure the vibration at some specific locations, you see that vibration dies out at those specific locations, but energy propagates. Here, energy does not propagate. Energy is localized here and the vibration amplitude gradually decreases. So these are two distinctly different wave propagation characteristics, and which is very, very different. If you just look at the anti-resonance frequencies, you couldn't understand that. You can only understand it if you look at these displacement amplitudes. And these are the cases for this mid-gap frequencies. Again, we have light gray areas here and we have gradual decreases. We have applied this approach to uh, three-dimensional uh, cases. This is body-centered cubic structure. This is face-centered cubic structure. Originally, the band structure is like this. If you apply the inertia amplification, then you can squish down these branches quite well. This is a, a, a frequency response function plot. You can see that we can obtain a, a lower limit of the gap below the reduced frequency of 0 0.5. So we can have a large low frequency gap. 
This is the first paper that we uh, experimentally validated that inertia amplification uh, can be experimentally proved and tested. So here we have a finite element and experimental results. They are quite well matching and we have a nice gap in between 280 Hertz and 610 Hertz. We have vibration transmission of only 1% in this region. Then we said that we have to uh, improve that. We have uh, used shape optimization approach to get this uh, two dimensional structure. In this case, we lowered the lower limits and increased the upper limit so that we have a wider gap and we have also better vibration isolation inside the gap. We reach almost like 10 to the minus three inside the gap. Then we applied it to a three dimensional setting. We have this, this is by the way, uh, manufactured with wire EDM from metal. And this is uh, 3D printed from polymer. And this three dimensional case, since it's from polymer, the resonance peaks are not that as sharp. You see these, these are sharp. These are not as sharp here. And especially at high frequencies, we have lower amount of uh, low quality resonances here. But in between, we have nice wide gaps for all three dimensions. Then we designed this uh, different mechanism, which has these long flexures, which uh, increase the bandwidth of the structure significantly. And this is the largest band gap ever obtained for a one dimensional system. I will explain the details in the coming slides. And I would like to show you how we obtain the two dimensional ultra wide mechanism in more detail. So I have shown you lots of slides, uh, just uh, some uh, one slide per paper here, but I would like to give more detail about this because this has a special design. And in this uh, table, which we get it from our 2020 paper, uh, paper with my uh, former PhD student, we listed one dimensional ultra wide systems. By the way, by ultra wide, I mean that the upper and lower limit ratio is greater than three, which gives you uh, arithmetic mean uh, bandwidth, normalized bandwidth of more than 100%. So every system here has more than 100% bandwidth in terms of the arithmetic mean. By the way, you can calculate the bandwidth in terms of the geometric mean as well. These are calculated there. But I prefer to use the ratio of the upper to the lower limit. Um, for example, if you are comparing very large bandwidths, 190%, 180%, you can't say that there's a much difference here. But if you look at the ratio of the lower and upper limits, there's a significant ratio. So this metric of dividing the upper limit to lower limit gives us more resolution in terms of understanding how wide the band gap are compared to other ones. So if you look at the one dimensional designs, uh, this design offers significantly higher gap compared to the other ones in the literature. And this 2020 paper reached a very large value for two dimensional designs. And in order to get this one, we use the design here and there, combine the two approaches to obtain this. And I would like to show you how we did that. First of all, I would like to explain how size optimization was done in the earlier study. We said that we would like to maximize this ratio second frequency to the first frequency, the lower and upper limits of the band gap. And I would like to give a constraint for the stiffness of this structure. So if I push from the two ends, there's a static stiffness of 1000 kilonewtons per meter. I would like to have 20% reduction in the output per unit cell. So this is for my band depth constraint. I have some fixed variables and I have some design variables. Design variables are thickness of this member and length of thickness of this, this member. For the shape optimized design, I have the same static stiffness. I would like to achieve more isolation. So I would like to give a more aggressive number here. I would like to reduce not by 20%, but 25% every unit cell. I have the same mass for both of them. I have divided uh, this link to 30 pieces so that the height of each one can be individually uh, changed to get this shape done. After the optimization, this is the size optimized design, this is the shape optimized design. The size optimized design has a lower bandwidth. Shape optimized design is much wider and you see depth is different as well. The black curve is deeper, so it has more attenuation. 
So indeed, shape optimized then gives us nice things. The very important thing about this design is that I was only dealing with one mechanism. I didn't deal with a periodic structure optimization. I just optimized this one. And the first vibration mode appeared at 255 Hertz. The second vibration mode is at 817 Hertz. In the first mode, this mechanism is like opening and closing. And in the second mode, the ends are rotating like that. If you combine these mechanisms in a periodical setting like this, there are 29 modes in which the mechanisms are opening and closing in different orientations. The next mode, which is the 30th mode, appears at a much higher frequency. And in that mode, we see the endpoints are rotating. So there is no other mode in between. So if you understand the first two modes of this mechanism, you can understand the lower and upper limit of the periodic structure. So designing, this was enough for getting the band gap limits. Then we manufactured it with wire EDM. We shake this structure. We get this uh, nice frequency response function plot, very nice matching. And we also excited with obliquely like this so that we can look at the both longitudinal and transverse waves. Both of them show the same band gap limits and less than 1% vibration isolation inside the gap limit, which was nice. Then we say that we would like to have much wider gap. So this is like upper limit to lower limit ratio is about like 3.1. We would like to achieve much more than that. We see that we have a fundamental flaw in the design of the mechanism in our earlier papers, which we didn't realize up to this point. We were dealing with this model and we said that, okay, it's a very nice model, which can give us two or three times the bandwidth, which is nice for those days. But if you would like to, understand the rigid link mechanism equivalent of this thing, you can, instead of these flexure hinges, you can put some pin joints and then you get this mechanism. If you op, uh, use the group as equation, you can see that this mechanism has three degrees of freedom, which means that this not only opens and closes, it can freely do these kind of rotations. That's why you cannot obtain this mode at a much higher frequency than the earlier mode. So that was a fundamental limit, which we didn't think of before drawing this rhythmic mechanism approach. Then we said, okay, what can we do with that? If we add these two extra links here, then the degree of freedom of the system reduces to one, then it can only do this motion. Now, remember this, the lower limit is governed by this. If this motion disappears, then the upper limit will be at a much, much higher frequency and, but physically realizing that was again done by flexure hinges because flexure hinges has no backlash, no rattle problem, no wear problem. We don't use pin joints. We always use flexure hinges. These are like compliant mechanisms. So instead of this, we use a long flexure here. Then we optimize this structure. The first frequency appears here, 6.9. The next one is 300, like 40 times here. And it's just transverse waves of these flexures by the way, these modes do not appear at the output because this is a one-dimensional system, which is only excited from the left-hand side. We look at the right-hand side. So this doesn't govern the upper limit, by the way. But at 373, we have some shearing motion you see here. Then the output moves at this point. So the upper limit will be governed by this frequency, lower limit by this one. The ratio is like 50 or so. It's huge gap. This is the largest gap ever obtained for a one-dimensional system. So you see that this is the middle uh, flat branch is due to the transverse modes here. These two gaps are appeared as combined gap from here to there for the frequency response function plot. And we, we see a very clean approach here. And if you use more and more number of units here, like if you have four units, you can increase the depth here and we have a very nice response. This was the best for a one dimensional case. And we said that, can we attach these nice optimized mechanisms in two dimensional setting so that we can have a very wide band gap in two dimensions? The answer is no. So the bad thing is that when you combine these two things in, let's say one of them is this way, the other one is that way, you cannot move the end this way and that way because if all of them are allowing motion in one dimension, they can't allow transverse motion, so they can't accept oblique excitations. So you need to give this mechanism room to rotate. 
And this does not give that. So you cannot get a two-dimensional design out of this. In order to do that, we have to change the endpoints. So we said that let's try to use this remote center mechanism at the endpoints here. By the way, we still use this uh, long flexures here, but these things allow us to rotate the endpoints. And we have a triangular block here, which we try to optimize its shape by topology optimization. And we put here a backbone uh, with a black uh, line here. If you don't put a backbone here, if when you put it in a topology optimization routine, the we would like to maximize the ratio of the second to the first natural frequency. It tries to minimize the first frequency and it makes it zero by eating out material here. Then the first mode is just junk. So you don't want that. So you want a mechanism to move back and forth. So you need a backbone. Backbone is here and there. Then the optimized shape, uh, we get fit for a volume fraction of more than 80%. And the optimized shape is like this. Topology, so it's optimized topology. We have little gaps here. We filled out that with some post-processing. And then in the topology optimization routine, we didn't include this section. Uh, we added that afterwards to post-processing. Then we use the finite element mesh here. Then we look at the first mode at 28.5, next one at 590, like more than 20 times, which is a huge gap here in between. Then we did a one-dimensional uh, approach as a uh, to see the band structure. Again, the lower and upper limits are the same, 29 and 590, and we have the ratio of more than 20. Arithmetic mean normalized bandwidth more than 180%. It's a huge gap, which is the wide, widest gap ever obtained for two-dimensional structures. Then this is the one-dimensional structures approach, just 1D. This is a 2D structure. For 2D structure, we would like to again look at the mode shapes that govern the lower and the upper limits. You see, the, again, these are opening and closing here for a 20th mode. Next one is 21st mode. Here, we see that we have some kind of transverse motion for these flexures. And indeed, this is the opening mode at 28.5 hertz. This is happening at 590 hertz. Look at that, 590.2, same mode, and 28.1. Again, opening mode. So again, the first two modes of this mechanism govern the lower and upper limit for this band gap. Then we build this structure. This structure is very big. It's like 35 kilograms, five centimeters thick. And uh, you cannot achieve in-plane motion for this large structure. So there's always some kind of out-of-plane bending modes of this structure. That's why you cannot, uh, you will always have some kind of uh, deteriorations here because of the out of plane modes. But nevertheless, up until like 400 years or so, we have almost exact match here. Then we have some uh, modal density increase in the out of plane modes. But the match is quite nice for this axial approach. Then we have oblique excitation. We see that. For the longitudinal and transverse directions, again, there's a quite nice match, especially up to until like 400 hertz or so, then we have some deterioration, but the results are quite satisfactory. I would like to show you a video of this thing in real action. Hello, this is the two-dimensional elastic metal material that works in very wide frequency range. Here we have an off flexorimeter, and then we have the imp flexorimeter. This is the shaker, the decollision system, and the computer for monitoring the vibration outputs. First, we're going to be dealing with the random input to the system. And then let's see. This is the input vibration. This is the output vibration. We see that the RMS value is about 0.5 G. Here, the RMS value is about 0.05 G and in this frequency range and let me enlarge this graph for you from 29 hertz up until 590 hertz the vibration transmission is less than one so here especially in this frequency range about like 500 to about like 30 hertz we are about one percent vibration transmission 
these peaks are due to the out of plane vibrations of the specimen. You see, this is the out of plane modes. As the specimen is not very thick, it can vibrate in out of plane. Nevertheless, we have a very wide frequency range from here up to there, from 29 hertz up to 590 hertz. Now I would like to show you how the wave propagates in this video. In this video, we will first see that the excitation will be coming from the right-hand side and the accelerometer from the left-hand side. So it will be first vibrating at a higher speed. Then I will have slow-mo mode. So it will be slowing down and you will see better what's going on there. So let me start this video. You see that the vibration is a lot here. Now it's slowed down. You have some vibration here, but if you look at these parts, you don't see any vibration at all. So vibration is localized here. It cannot propagate to the lattice. So that's a typical case for a inertia amplification induced gap. So as we localize the vibrations here, we don't feel anything at all. So I would like to show you uh, inertia amplification mechanisms on host structures. These were done with various researchers uh, around the world. So this is on a plate structure. This is on a beam structure to obtain low frequency gaps. This is for acoustic approach. So we have some incident wave reflect and uh, transmitted wave. And we see a broadband transmission loss for the inertia amplified beam. We see that the mechanisms, inertia amplification mechanisms are embedded in this beam. It's on the other side here with some negative stiffness springs here to lower the frequency even lower. This is for a composite sandwich panel. Again, amplification mechanisms are used on the top to obtain gaps at certain frequencies. These are for inertia amplification mechanism in double negative and hyperbolic elastic metamaterials. You see our amplification mechanism here, there, there. These are for acoustic imaging and lensing applications. There are also chiral inertia amplification mechanisms that are uh, designed with different kinds of mechanisms. This is our work with my former master's student. And if you increase uh, this, if you decrease this angle theta, you can re reduce the branches here and reduce the anti-resonance frequency. This is a different kind of mechanism. If you push this thing from up and uh, bottom, the middle section can rotate like this and that. Again, it's a chiral structure. This is the in-plane chiral structure. When you push these two ends, this, this can rotate like that. A two-dimensional one is again here, showing this similar structure. Here we have the same handed helices combined. Here we have different handed helices, right and left hand helices. This, this can rotate more in this setting. So it is a large gap. It's comparing these two different kind of um, helices. In this one, there is a disc rotation. Here we have a cube rotation and it has different attachment points there. So it has different response. So there are very different kinds of mechanisms that have been produced by using this inertia amplification approach. Uh, this is by uh, Professor Toll's group. So they have used this inertia amplification mechanism together with periodic materials uh, to obtain large damping in this setting. And this is an energy harvesting approach. So this resonator, the frequency is reduced by this inertia amplification approach to obtain energy harvesting at low frequencies, which is a hard thing to do. As the inertia amplification approach gives us broadband low frequency gaps, it is an ideal candidate for seismic applications. So this is a seismic metamaterial. Here is like solid. We have like lever type amplification mechanism to obtain low frequency gaps. And here another version of that. So there are lots of amplification mechanisms on top of it semi-infinite media, by changing the angle here, different vibration characteristics can be obtained. So in conclusion, I can say that Bragg scattering and inertia amplification mechanisms are different. First of all, inertia amplification gives us gaps below the Bragg limit. So, so they are like sub-wavelength. Local as well as inertia amplification gaps are different. There are, we see that the wave propagation characteristics are different. and resonance generation methods are different. We can use very small masses and cr create large approaches. And so by using inertia amplification, we can have wide gaps below the Bragg limit without using large masses. So for future outlook, local as method is easier to understand. 
easier to apply and widely exploited. There are many papers on this one. If you look at inertia amplification, it's harder to understand. We wrote the first paper in 2007 for like five or 10 years, not many people understood that, but over the last five years or so, people uh, uh, found the opportunities in this kind of designs and many paper appeared. And we have, if you have a design about low frequencies, if you wanna achieve broadband responses, and if you want something lightweight yet low frequency and broadband, inertia amplification is the way to do that. And there are several design alternatives, one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, chiral, bridge type, lever type. So there are many, many opportunities. So with the game changing lever action, opportunities on one side can outweigh the other side. So this pile is growing up. So if you have any questions, I can answer them. Thank you, Professor Yilmaz, for this great talk. It was it was a very interesting uh, topic, and it was something uh, we are also interested in. We see the opportunities there, uh, and I'm happy that it's getting more attention from our communities. All right, so let's get questions from our audience. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, I, I let me start with the first question then. Uh, so in the design, like you, you mentioned that, like for the uh, band gaps and for the uh, inertial amplification, uh, sorry, for the local resonant uh, mechanism and for the inertial amplification mechanism, you tune the stiffness um, of the lattice. So now, when you do it with this complicated structures, how do you tune the, how do you achieve the desired stiffness? How do you match these stiffness values okay. in the designs you manufacture? Right. It, it is something hard. Uh, it's not that hard, in fact. So, huh? okay. so if you look at this design, for example, most of the deformation is, at these flex ranges. So there is not much deformation there. So if you know the relative, dip, uh, like you know the dimensions of these flexures mm -hmm. and you would know the angle between them, you can analytically get the equation for stiffness very easily. And oh, you can okay. also computationally get that. The shape of this design is more on the mass side. So in fact, why this design works, let me explain it. So you see that after the optimization, most of the mass is concentrated towards the middle here. If you wanna open this up and down, like let me show you, compare this and that. If this is rotating about this point and there is more vibration at this point, you see there's less vibration here, more vibration. Most vibration is at this point. So mm -hmm. if you put more mass at this point, then the system will be dynamically more heavy. So effective mass will be larger if you put more and more and mass here. That's why the code stole some mass from here and put it there. But that, that's not exactly true, let me say, because the, in the next mode, in this mode, you would like to increase the rotational mode or like the torsional mode. So it's a little bit more complicated. So you would like to decrease this and increase that. So mm -hmm. they're like competing with each other. And this is a little bit harder to investigate analytically, but the main idea is to lower the first frequency, the code wants to put more mass at this point. Okay. But stiffness, so, you can calculate it analytically, no big deal. Is it like just topology optimization or what, what type of optimization? This is shape optimization, but this is topology optimization. This is, so we, we can write our own codes. This is written by us, so in MATLAB. So you can do SIMP approach. This is a, a standard approach and mm -hmm. you can calculate those kind of things quite easily. That's great. There is one thing in the chat, I think. Yeah. Is it possible to create a cluster of closed space anti-resonances via the inertial amplification idea to achieve larger attenuation? So Sidat uh, asks this question. 
right yes you can do that uh can i let me see here we have two of them in fact here uh, i don't have the uh, graphs here but we can put three or four antiresonance frequencies but design with that is a little bit harder because when you put antiresonance frequencies side by side you don't want resonance frequencies popping up in the middle so it, it requires a little bit uh, delicate design there but you don't always need many antiresonance frequencies here. The idea is that you put an antiresonance frequency and if, if this can stay like for long uh, frequency range here, large frequency range, then the resonances pop up there. So you don't need extra antiresonance frequencies, but in some designs, it may be good in terms of lowering locally the values. And in fact, we have an acoustic design, which I don't have it here, but uh, we have used many antiresonance frequencies to achieve large bandwidth uh, acoustically, but I don't have it here, so. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, it was an excellent talk. Um, I was wondering, so in your optimization codes, how do you make sure that uh, the final structures are actually realizable so you don't have, you know, regions that are extremely thin, uh, unpractically thin? I see. So we did it this way. So here we have one millimeter by one millimeter pixels. And when we did the optimization, we tried to produce this specimen by using wire EDM. And in wire EDM, the smallest feature size that we can produce with our machine is 0 0.3 millimeter. So we did the optimization with one millimeter by one millimeter pixels. So the thicknesses cannot be lower than that. Okay. Then we said that we can achieve more. By the way, we could have used smaller uh, pixel sizes. In that case, computational time was very large. So we did our optimization here. Then we minimize the thicknesses here on the flexures to this level, 0 0.3. Then we get this response. So by choosing the pixel size, we can do that. But is this structure, you know, um, robust, mechanically robust, because um, you have some heavy, you know, components that are connected through very thin wires? Very robust. I mean, let me show you this video one more time. This is from steel, by the way. All these flexures are 0 0.3 meter, millimeter thick, which is like 50 millimeters high. The length is very small, but since they are very thin, they are very compliant. Look at the mm -hmm. deformations there. I have done this. This is two years old. I have done this experiment many times. Probably that more than a million cycles have been passed. So fatigue test has been done. And no problem there. Okay. In fact, uh, in fact I, I cannot show you right now here, but uh, we did a seismic three-dimensional metamaterial, which is on the way of publication now. It's like we are preparing that. It can carry load on that, and it is three-dimensional, and it can create, it can carry a lot of load, which has also thin flexures. If the thin flexures are properly designed, then they can flex in the uh, elastic limit, between the elastic limit, so no problem appears. No fatigue problem whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And if I may ask another question. Sure. Did you look at, you know, um, active structures, maybe uh, some actuator inside a structure in order to maybe enhance the... Yeah, we did that. Let me show you in as an extra slide. So we have a self-tuning adaptive passive lever type vibration isolation system. It is self-powered by the input vibration. Uh, it can track the excitation frequency. It can be a fixed one. It can match that or it can track it. There is no electric sensors, no actuators, no control circuitry. Everything is fully mechanical and there's no external electrical energy. But it's not periodic yet. It's just a single unit we designed. Let me show you that. So we have this lever type structure and you can get the transmissibility equation very easily. Uh, we ha I have shown you that this motion is coupled to the base and the payload mass. We, have, we know that easy stuff. Let me show you the key issue, how we designed this thing. When this system is vibrating, when any system is rotating or moving any motion, doing any motion, there will be an instantaneous center of rotation. So instantaneous center of rotation, 
if you excite the system at a frequency lower than the resonance frequency appears at this point. Instantaneous center of rotation for this lever is at the base hinge when the system is at resonance, which makes sense because there is almost zero motion here at the base and there will be a high amount of motion at the payload. So that's the resonance condition. If you increase the frequency more, then instantaneous center appears here. At the end resonance frequency, instantaneous center is exactly at the payload hinge, which means that now the payload is stationary. There is input, but there is zero output. And if you increase it more, then it moves to the right. So if you increase the in frequency, the instantaneous center of rotation moves to the right like that. So how can we design a self-tuning and self-powered system out of this finding? So we had a uh, flow chart here. We are measuring the velocity at the two points side and uh, near the payload hinge. And if you have a higher velocity, there will be a higher force at, applied at this point. If you have a lower velocity, lower force. But these are in opposite sense. The net force will be moving this lever, which can move inside this frictionless guide. To realize that, we used elastic fins here. And in fact, suppose that our initial instantaneous center is there. So this has lower motion than this one. So there will be more hits on this side. There will be more flexing. So there will be more force. The tangential force here is bigger than this one. So net force is more to the right-hand side and it will move this lever to the right, which means that the instantaneous center will be moving there. Whenever you reach this position, both sides have the same amplitude. So it will stop at this point. So it will always go to this. If you are at this point, left force will be more. So it will again push it to this one and you will again reach this anti-resonance condition. So let me show you this case. If you have your lever at this point, it is the shortest level. Shortest lever gives you the highest anti-resonance frequency of 30 hertz. In the middle point, we have 25 hertz. And if it's extended all the way to the right, it's at 20 hertz. If you take out the lever, then there is no anti-resonance frequency, but you just have a resonance frequency. Now, in this system, there is no actuation here. If you say that, I would like to just look at the response. These are the uh, four different uh, transfer functions. but if you say that I use my V-type actuator system here, which is just pushing it from the bottom side as with vibration, then if I start with this blue curve, I'm at this point on this lever, 173.1. And as this hits, the blue curve goes to this red curve. The transfer function of the system changes to the black curve. And now I'm at the anti-resonance frequency. If I start with this black curve, which has this all the way to extend it here, now I excite this system at this frequency, then it has to shrink down to the left hand side. Then the blue curve, black curve, sorry, goes to the right to the red one and the blue one, then it goes down. In fact, these are the uh, measurements, by the way, both of them. It can track left uh, from 30 hertz to 20 hertz sweep or 20 hertz to 30 hertz sweep. We are always at low transmissibility, we don't see any kind of high outputs. And this is a, a photo of this uh, system. If you tune it to 25 Hertz, you see that the central point is very bright, uh, very crisp. And the other ones are blurry. The blurry ones are there because there is high amount of vibration. Here, we have instantaneous center of rotation exact at this point, And the output is very small. And the, all the other parts are very blurry because of high vibration. And let me show you this video to demonstrate what's going on here. So I will be tuning this to 25 hertz. Initially it's at 30 hertz, so it will extend to the right. And then you'll see that when we disturb this system, it will reject these disturbances. It extends to the right. Now it's tuned, it's at lower vibration. We disturb it by finger. It's large amplitude vibration. It again finds its position. It rotates. Then we can pull it back. Again, it pulls it by itself with the self vibration case and it reduces the vibration significantly. So it's just working with the input vibration here. No sensors, 
no electric actuators, no control circuitry whatsoever. It's just the ambient vibration that tunes itself like that. Right, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yulmaz. So we have two more questions, but it's four two. Um, but uh, I think the, the first question you already- uh, But think, yeah, we, yeah there, there's no, yeah, we have, we, we always use mm -hmm. materials that can withstand these kind of alternating motions and there is no fatigue problem whatsoever yet. And okay. in 21, let me look at this one. Mm -hmm. Let me look at that slide. Okay. Uh, yes. So let me explain that. So in order to uh, achieve local resonance gap, the system has to resonate. And in fact, here in this system, these members are resonating at a specific frequency, which we can calculate that. After that, we can have the uh, local resonance induced gap. So that's the nature of this design. So that's why we have this dip, then it goes on like that. We can analytically obtain these frequencies. You can look at the paper and you, you can find that. That's deliberate. Okay. So is there any follow-up question on this? All clear? All right then. So let me join, uh, please join me uh, with our thanks to Professor Yulmaz. Uh, it was a great talk and thanks for delivering it today. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here at Michigan.